Okay, part two. Now let's have a look at these two lines, the patriotic tear that brimmed in his eye and sweating like molten iron from the center of his chest. I want you to have a look at these two lines here and notice what changed and why. So if you can have a look at these two lines and pause and have a think about that. So the action from brimmed to sweating suggests a much greater force, doesn't it? A more labored action. There's a change in tense from past, what used to happen as well, to continuous and suggests that it's happening right now. It's immediate, there's the immediacy of this. From the eye to the chest suggests the experience was something observed before the war, but now it's an actual physical feeling in his body. The chest area suggests in the heart. On one level, the experience has become a physical one and also a more emotional one. It suggests he's aware of his heart pumping with adrenaline. And then from patriotic tear to molten iron as well, this suggests the shift from a patriotic belief that is held through choice to a feeling that's out of control and strong enough to melt iron. The sense of extreme heat helps to convey this strong emotion like fear, panic, determination. The experience is almost beyond normal human emotions. So let's have a look now at stanza two. And what is he thinking here? I would like you to pause again and consider what he's thinking here. I've highlighted some sections here for you. So pause. Okay, so almost stopped in what cold clockwork. It sounds like he's a very, un, it's a very unfeel, he's a very unfeeling piece of ma machinery here, as if it's just, he's just a clock. It's dehumanizing in a sense. And also the nation suggests that the battle was arranged by either fate and the gods or by governments, but not by him. In terms of the hand and also of his still running, the battle is decided by somebody else but he carries out the action of war with his hands. He has become the hands for somebody else. Okay, so we've got this imagery as well of clocks as well. Um, oh, jumped in the dark. This also shows that he's completely confused as well. And it's also an idiom, which means not knowing. Only when you're on the battlefield do you see what it all means. Um, and then mid stride, but it's already started he can't stop now he's asking himself entirely in this stanza what is he doing why is he doing this and we've also got this punctuation and the sentence structure which helps to slow down the stanza it's as if the soldier is thinking in slow motion here okay let's have a look at Stanza two again, and I want you to complete these questions using PEE -E paragraphs. So if you could pause here, answer the questions, and then I'll discuss. So what does the soldier mean by cold clockwork? Well, decisions about war are taken without an emotional response, and clockwork makes the decisions and processes that lead to war sound mechanical here. A clock works because of numerous cogs and wheels. The soldier is just one small cog in the whole operation of war, but can, can cause a huge amount of destruction. And what is the soldier's attitude towards war at this point in the poem? The soldier is really questioning his role here. He doesn't really understand how he's ended up here, does he? So which phrase does the poet use to show that the soldier is confused by what's happening? And we've got in the dark. The word dark suggests he can't see the reasons why he's in this situation. And it could also be linked to sinister or horrible events. And in terms of the punctuation and sentence structure, well, the soldier is having these thoughts as he races into battle, but it's too late. In reality, these thoughts would flash through his mind in a second. 
Hughes uses a dash to bring a pause so that he can explore the idea that it's only when the soldier is about to go into battle does he really question his actions. And the rhetorical question and complex sentence that follow slow down the pace of reading. This brings focus to one of the poem's central ideas that soldiers carry out the worst aspect of war, but do not create it by organizing it. Now let's have a look at the furrows, shot slashed furrows. So furrows are usually straight trenches made by a plow to sow seeds and they would be the marks made in the mud by skidding bullets but the furrows made would not be in straight lines like this, more like the image here. Okay so that's that imagery there. Now what I want you to think of is the colour and the use of animals or the hair specifically in this poem. So think what color is bravery? What color is cowardice? If bravery were an animal, what would it be? And if cowardice were an animal, what would it be? Let's have a look then. We've got the hair here and it's yellow. So the hair seems to wake the soldier from his bewilderment. What do you think the hair could symbolize? Give you a moment, pause. So here the hair could symbolize helplessness, nature, fear perhaps, suffering and cowardice. In terms of the yellow, yellow is often a color associated with cowardice. So let's have a look at the final stanza. So Let's have a look at some of the elements here. We've got the yellow hair, which we've just discussed. Now we think, is it a real hair? This is a metaphor, okay? It's maybe a coward. Yellow is the color of fear and hairs are prey. There's a natural and frightened image juxtaposed with his own machine like nature. And it's possible that the hare is another soldier scot shot and scared trying to escape. And again, we've got this dehumanization, which is prevalent in the poem. In terms of the use of plunged here, it plunges implies diving in too deep and to the point of no return. He's made his decision to carry on and there's no turning back. Now we've got a list here of king, honor, human dignity, and et cetera. We've got key motivations for war, emphasizes that here and now they are second to the rush of battle, but the et cetera, meaning kind of, and so on, that is really, really important to note as well. It kind of just, it could be anything, whatever, whatever, whatever. So read into what Ted Hughes is saying that, it's the pointlessness of war, which, if you consider that Ted Hughes was a massive fan of Wilfred Owen and the themes and the pointlessness of war that we saw in Wilfred Owen's poem, you can see the connection here with his Hughes's own feelings as well. We've also got the atmospheric description, the blue crackling air. Now this is similar to the air was electric. The word crackling gives an element of danger to the verse as well. And then we've got metaphor and consonants of T, terrors, touchy dynamite. It emphasizes this adrenaline rush and almost animal-like reactions. Think of a cat that's <laughs> prepared to flight, to fight or flee. Okay, so there we've analyzed that entire poem now. I want to have a look at this slide here. Now I've highlighted some of the similes that are in the poem and there are actually six similes in this poem which is on average about one every sentence um, the use of similes are very very significant here as Hughes uses this very clever literary device to make something impossible to describe understandable now bear in mind that Ted Hughes a was never in world war one and b maybe didn't understand the horror of it in its entirety, okay? Never experienced it. So what he's using here is something else to describe it, okay? So if I saw an alien, for example, and wanted to describe it, 
I would probably say something like it was as tall as a building or it had hair streaming out of its head like snakes. I'm using similes there to describe it because I can't explain the thing itself because I don't fully understand it. So I use similes to articulate what it was like. So here, it's as if Hughes is using these similes as a very clever literary device to express the sheer horrors of war because he fully doesn't understand it himself. War is so terrible, he can't describe it. He has to revert back to using these similes to say what it's like because he can't say what, because it's so awful. So really, really important to note those similes. And that's a very high level analysis that's gonna get you a lot of marks if you note that. Okay, oh, it's not the end of the slideshow, sorry. Just one note that I want to make in terms of the structure. Um, there are three parts of this poem which makes us think more of a hunt, uh, more of a hunt or animals than humanity. Um, the char, uh, sorry, the, uh, the the parts of this poem which makes us think more of a hunt or animals than humanity, and the charge to the green hedge seems to be more the action of an animal bolting in a field rather than soldiers charging a trench. We've got the inclusion of the yellow hair being really powerful. We see the soldier in a moment of confusion, not sure why he's there and what he's doing. The hair seems to spur him on, either because he doesn't want to be a coward or because it reflects a brief moment of man and nature connecting before war once again breaks in. So this work is largely blank verse with no set structure. In part, the different lines show the pace of the charge, sometimes fast and sometimes stumbling. Towards the end, it picks up speed, perhaps as he approaches his destination or his doom. And obviously, as we've described before, the poet uses a lot of enjambement and sessures to give a bizarre and erratic speed to the poem. And this, again, helps to give a structure to the speed of the charge, but also the confusion and intensity of the battle with explosions and gunfire, as well as the jumbled thoughts of the soldier. So think now what the poem explores. Well, if you pause, the poem explores a soldier's charge through a mix of physical and emotional exploration. And the language of the poem seems to juxtapose natural animal images and the human machine. They're at conflict. So herein lies the conflict. And again, the mix of sejura and enjambment in the poem adds a chaotic tone to show the confusion of war and the inner turmoil of the soldier. So there we have the main themes, the main point, the main literary devices being used within the poem, an exceptionally difficult poem to analyse, probably the most difficult out of your um, power and conflict anthology. Um, so if you can have a look at it on this kind of uh, structural form level, consider the similes being used very significantly, this use of the enjambement and Sejiro as well the dashes too. Okay, thank you.